this is probably one of the most important videos in microbiology, um, particularly from a world health standpoint. And that's because in this video, we're going to talk about the plasmodia. Um, plasmodia are the organisms that cause malaria. And malaria, they're just, if in case for some reason you've been living under a rock and don't know that malaria is a huge deal, there are between one to five billion febrile illnesses per year and one to three million deaths per year because of malaria. So this is a huge deal, even though, um, I, I mean, there's so many people that are affected by it, so much research that goes into it. Um, approximately 85% of these um, infections occur in Africa, um, and this is really a huge focus for World Health Initiatives. All right, so let's get into kind of the main characteristics of the plasmodium species, since this is actually kind of the crux of the organisms that lead to malarial disease. Um, first off, these are parasites, and as such, they are characterized like parasites. So um, all of the plasmodia are coccidians, um, and they are sporozoan parasites specifically. Um, they parasitize red blood cells, and that's actually how we wind up actually seeing disease, although we can also see them um, in the liver. So we see kind of disease as a result of the red blood cell stage, but they also spend time in other body organs. Um, okay, because they're a coccidian, they actually require two hosts. Um, so they're zoonotic, right? So one of those hosts is the Anopheles mosquito, and that is actually where they do all of their sexual reproduction. Um, and this is a picture of an Anopheles mosquito taking a blood meal. You can see that the abdomen is full of blood here. Um, so this is the little bugger that's actually the cause of all the trouble. Um, and then vertebrates, which would be us, that's where they do actually all of their asexual reproduction. So they need these two phases. And that's not uncommon for parasites. We haven't really talked about that a lot. But with a lot of parasites, if they have very complex multi-organism um, life cycles, it's because in certain hosts, they kind of complete certain stages of development. So kind of like you, you know, you did some development in high school and some development in college, and, you know, now you're coming to med school to further your educational development and, you know, eventually be released out into the world as a practicing doctor. So um, parasites aren't all that different. They show up different places, they learn some things, they grow, and then they move on to the next place. Um, okay, so there are actually five species of plasmodia that lead to malaria. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I'm kind of a big musical theater, uh, theater fan. Um, and there's this song in the Broadway musical Chicago called The Five Merry Murderesses of Cook County. And that's what always comes to mind when I think of the five merry malarial parasites. So we have... Um, P. falciparum, P. nolesi, P. vivax, P. ovalve, ovale, and P. malariae. Um, I think actually the song is the six Mary murderesses, but for whatever reason, Mary and malaria go together, so now it's five. Um, so I'm going to talk in this video about each of them. Um, it's important to note that P. vivax and P. ovale are so similar that I'm going to talk to them together. Um, we're just going to handle them kind of like they're one organism, and I'll point out um, the things that are specifically different about them. If you are a fan of Sketchy Micro, I will point out that the video for malaria and the anti-malarial drugs is actually very good. Um, I'm not going to talk about the anti-malarial drugs. I do believe that your pharmacology discipline director has put together um, some materials for you on that. But that video can actually be really helpful in making sense of the anti-malarials because they are numerous and which ones you use when. Um, can be somewhat confusing, and malaria prophylaxis is actually a really um, big topic that it's important to understand as a practicing physician. All right, I am normally not somebody that's going to tell you to memorize a life cycle, 
I might ask you to memorize an infective stage or a diagnostic stage, but I rarely tell you you have to know all of the stages of a parasitic life cycle. This time, I want you to do it. You have to know the malarial life cycle. You need to know it in detail. You need to know every single stage and what cell it shows up in. I'm going to ask you this. Step is going to ask you this. Boards are going to ask you this. This is the life cycle that I bet you if you asked some of your preceptors, they could still recite this life cycle. This is an important one. You're going to know it. All right. So let's get into it. First step is pretty easy. We get infected with malaria when an infected Anopheles mosquito takes a blood meal. Similarly, the mosquito gets infected when it takes a blood meal from an infected person. So the entire transmission between mosquito to man and man to mosquito happens when the mosquito takes the blood meal. All right. Now, let's start up here. If an infected mosquito bites an uninfected host, this is going to introduce infectious sporozoites into the host, okay? So that gives us our infective stage. Our infective stage are the sporozoites. Keep track of these stages as we go through them, all right? And the way it does this is it does this using its saliva, right? So we have productive chronic infection in this mosquito's salivary glands. The sporozoites are transmitted in the saliva into the uninfected person. All right, now those sporozoites are gonna travel to the liver, okay? While in the liver, so our next stage is our liver stage, they're gonna actually mature using asexual reproduction to form schizonts or schizonts. There's a couple different pronunciations for it. All right, so the schizonts are gonna form in the liver. Once they've kind of begun to form, so this is a liver cell, the sporozoites go in it, you've got an infected liver cell, and now look, you've got this liver cell that's just full, absolutely full of schizonts, okay? This is called the exoerythrocytic cycle. So really that just means outside of the red blood cells, okay? Because the red blood cells are kind of the important part. All right, so we've got this hepatocyte that's just chock full of schizonts, all right? The liver cell is going to rupture. As it ruptures, it actually releases merozoites. This is our next stage, all right? The merozoites, um, this is kind of the initial stage in uh, that, comes out, all right? So I'm gonna take a side note here. So when the schizont ruptures, it removes, it releases the merozoites. Um, the other term for this exoerythrocytic cycle, sometimes people refer to it as exoerythrocytic schizogony. Um, basically, it's just, this is where the schizonts are found and it's not in red blood cells, okay? So that's just kind of a good way of thinking of that. All right, there's also another thing that we should keep in mind here. And that actually has to do with two of our species of plasmodia, and that's P. vivax and P. ovale. Remember I said that those two kind of act as a team, right? They act together. It's at this stage, this exoerythrocytic stage, that P. vivax and P. ovale can enter actually a dormant stage, okay? They can actually go dormant in the liver when they form this stage known as hypnozoites. So I want you to just think of it like hypnotism. Make, the hypnotist is standing in front of the liver cells, and in this case, the hypnotist is P. vivax and P. ovale, saying, you're getting sleepy, very sleepy. Well, it's hypnotizing them so that it can stay dormant in the liver, okay? This causes relapses in the bloodstream of malaria, basically weeks or even years later, as these P. vivax and P. ovale schizonts basically reappear. So they start as schizonts, well, actually, they start as sporozoites, they become schizonts, they go into hypnozoites, and then they come back into schizonts and kind of rejoin the life cycle. All right? All right, let's get back to our regularly scheduled program. So we had infective stage, sporozoites. 
They went into the liver. They became schizonts. The schizont grew and grew and grew and grew and then ruptured, releasing merozoites into the bloodstream. All right. The merozoites can actually infect the red blood cells. And remember, that's kind of where the big show is. All right. So the merozoites infect the red blood cells where they further undergo a sexual multiplication. And this is the erythrocytic cycle. Sometimes this is actually referred to as erythrocytic schizogony. Um, basically, you had your schizogony that occurred in the liver cell. Now we've got schizogony occurring in the red blood cell. All right. All right. Once in the red blood cell, okay, so this merozoite came in here and it infected our red blood cell. Now it's going to continue its development. And the first thing it's going to do is become a trophozoite, okay? And the trophozoite is characterized by this ring stage. So the merozoite inside the RBC becomes an immature trophozoite, which we can see as a ring, all right? This stage is completely characterized by these ring stages. The trophozoites will then move on and mature, and they're going to do one of two things. They're either going to become a mature trophozoite, which then goes back into a schizont. The schizont ruptures, and the whole stage starts over again. Okay, so you've got schizont, ruptured schizont, merozoite, merozoite infects the red blood cell, becomes a trophozoite. And this is that cycle. This is the cycle of malaria that basically leads to red blood cell rupture. And that's one of the major issues that um, kind of leads to disease. Now, there is another path. And this is the path that can actually um, change how we wind up seeing um, malaria. So some of the immature trophozoites will actually become gametocytes, all right? And when they become gametes, now they're capable of sexual reproduction within the erythrocyte. The gametocytes then get taken up by an Anopheles mosquito. Once they get taken up by the Anopheles mosquito, then they're going to do sexual reproduction inside the Anopheles mosquito. So that's where they're going to become a macrogametocyte, and then an oconete, and then an oocyst, and then it's going to rupture the oocyst, which releases sporozoites, which can then be injected into the human, and the whole thing starts again. I have these stages listed out in your course notes, but let's talk about some take-home points, okay? Our infective stage is our sporozoite. Our liver stage is the schizont. Our red blood cell stage is the merozoite and the trophozoite. And the trophozoite, which is the ring form, is actually also our diagnostic stage. So these are kind of the stages that we need to keep in mind as we're thinking about the normal life cycle of malaria. All right, so that's the life cycle. Um, the All of the plasmodia, for the most part, follow the same life cycle, with the exception of P. vivax and ovale, which have that ability to go dormant with their hypnozoites, right? So now we're going to talk about each of the types of plasmodia and kind of the slight differences in their clinical presentation and their pathology identification that you might see. So the first and most common, and this is probably what most people, this is the organism most people think of when they think about malaria, is Plasmodium falciparum, okay? Of the Plasmodia that cause malaria, P. falciparum actually has the shortest incubation period. It's about seven to 10 days um, after the patient has been bitten by an Anopheles mosquito. So the first thing that happens is the patient basically has that undifferentiated flu-like symptoms, okay? Um, and at that point, if you're looking at somebody and assessing them from for malaria, all they have is flu-like symptoms. So it could literally be anything from malaria to Zika to depending on the area and what's been going on, Ebola or Lhasa, or it could just be the flu. So really at this point, we don't really know what we're dealing with. Um, what is kind of um, not pathognomonic, but you know, very clinically relevant as far as like understanding P. falciparum is actually the fever cycle, okay? So P. falciparum exhibits a daily fever cycle, and this is known as a quotidian fever cycle. 
the fever is going to be accompanied by um, nausea and vomiting, um, certainly abdominal cramps, um, maybe some diarrhea, some real gastrointestinal discomfort. And I, I think this is something that um, students often kind of forget about. So then when they see like a vignette that talks about gastrointestinal upset in a traveling patient, they actually think of like traveler's diarrhea. They think of like E. coli. Um, but malaria totally includes gastrointestinal um, upset. Um, and this fever cycle, this once a day high fever and flu-like symptoms associated with gastrointestinal distress is actually a result of the cycle of the cells kind of going in and out of the different stages of their life cycle. So the parasite, okay? So this can go on for several days. Um, and then the periodicity of these fever attacks can remain variable kind of once a day happening, or it can become tertian, okay? So tertian literally means every like two to three days. So, or like day and a half to two days. So tertian basically means every 36 to 48 hours. So then it becomes a little bit more reliable. If every 36 to 48 hours, your patient is spiking a fever and having some gastrointestinal um, upset, then you might be looking at P. falciparum. Um, this, this tertian cycle is what actually leads to fulminating disease. Um, and that can often be referred to as malignant tertian malaria. Um, P. falciparum is the most likely of the malaria organisms to result in death if left untreated. Um, because basically what happens is you get mass destruction of red blood cells. The red blood cells just get lysed all over. Because really, remember, since we have such a short fever cycle, this parasite is replicating pretty quickly. And every time it replicates, it's bursting more and more red blood cells. Um, so the erythrocytes become um, destroyed. Too many dead erythrocytes, these mass quantities of destruction of erythrocytes becomes toxic. Um, and then the erythrocytes begin causing basically clotting because they begin to adhere to the vascular endothelium, um, adjacent erythrocytes, and that basically just causes capillary plugging. Um, and this can lead to all sorts of things. It can lead to cerebral malaria, causing coma and death. Um, it can cause kidney damage. Um, and the kidney damage is actually what results in black water fever here. Um, so black water fever is basically what happens when the kidneys are no longer functioning the way we expect them to because you've had this erythrocytic um, damage basically. Um, the black water fever is actually characterized by an intravascular hemolysis with rapid destruction of red blood cells, marked hemoglobinuria, um, acute renal failure, tubular necrosis, nephrotic syndrome, and death. Um, liver involvement is obviously also associated with this, right? Because we do see um, the schizogony, uh, the exoerythrocytic schizogony happening in the liver. Um, and when there's liver involvement, you can get abdominal pain, vomiting, um, and the vomit will contain bile, um, severe diarrhea, and rapid dehydration. Okay, so how are we going to identify um, Plasmodium falciparum. You're going to look for characteristic rings in multiple or single cells. You can also look for like a crescent shaped gametocyte. So um, let me see if I could. So these are kind of your rings right here. Um, and then over here is the um, kind of crescent shaped. Um, gametocyte. Sketchy calls this a banana-shaped gametocyte, but either way, you can see it in the blood smear pretty clearly. Um, you can also do um, a rapid diagnostic test. Those are available, um, and they're used for antigen detection using immunochromograph uh, chromograph chromatographic, there we go, lateral flow strip. Um, there's also monoclonal antibodies that you can use for specific plasmodium targets. All right, next malarial organism. This is P. Nolesi, or Nalesi. Um, this one's a little bit different in its endemic area. Um, so this one is more associated with um, kind of Asia. So we see it in Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Brunei, Indonesia, Myanmar, Vietnam, the Philippines. Um, so kind of that area of the world. Um, whereas I think a lot of people um, basically think of malaria as an African illness, and it certainly, that is 
that is not the case. Um, it, and that's why I think it's really important to recognize malaria as kind of a world health um, issue. Um, the clinical syndrome for this one is a little bit um, similar to p syndrome. Once again, we have that quotidian uh, cycle, that daily fever and chills, fever and chills. Um, in this case, the other symptoms that we might expect to see are things like headache, um, rigors, um, let's see, what else, uh, malaise, and you're still going to have that abdominal pain, some gastrointestinal upset. Um, you can also have breathlessness and productive cough, um, tachypnea, pyrexia, tachycardia, all of these things are kind of associated with penolesi. Um, and then additionally, as kind of the uh, disease goes on, as it progressives, progresses, we see thrombocytopenia and hepatic dysfunction. And the hepatic dysfunction is pretty easy to understand because remember we have that liver stage of disease. Um, so for laboratory diagnosis, once again, we're gonna look for those trophozoite rings. Um, so they're pretty, you know, you can find them pretty easy, these fine ring forms, or you can look for double chromatin dots. You're, you're gonna probably see two to three um, parasites per red blood cell, and they can have kind of a characteristic bird's eye appearance. Um, you can also look for mature trophozoites, just kind of depending on the age of the organism at the time you're looking. And remember that age actually happens pretty quickly. It changes pretty quickly because we've got a daily cycle for things. Okay, um, P. vivax and ovale, remember they're kind of, we, we kind of take them together and they're the ones that are able to produce that dormant cycle. Um, and they do that because they're able to develop that hypnozoite stage. So they have this extra um, maturation stage than some of the other ones. Um, these guys are special because they actually only invade young, immature red blood cells. And the reason for that is that it's these young, immature red blood cells that have the Duffy blood group antigen, um, which has kind of long been considered the primary receptor for P. vivax. Um, but it is also able to infect Duffy negative erythrocytes, so that's not the only way. Um, infections by P. vivax are kind of shown as enlarged erythrocytes with numerous pink granules or Schufner dots. Um, and once again, the trophozoite stage is kind of ring shaped. So that's what I'm showing here. Um, clinical syndrome. So this one has a little bit longer incubation period, 10 to 17 days as opposed to seven to 10, which we talked about, about with P. falciparum. You're then gonna get like a sudden onset of flu-like symptoms. Um, flu-like symptoms, you know, kind of like we see with, you know, general febrile illnesses, headache, muscle pain. Um, you might also expect to see some photophobia in patients with this one, um, potentially due to the headache, um, anorexia or, you know, decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, and anytime a patient is nauseous, you also have to wonder if their decreased appetite is also due to their nausea. Um, and then as the infection progresses, we're going to get a typical pattern of chills and fevers and malarial rigors. Um, and these paroxysms are going to occur every 48 hours, okay, so every two days, so slightly different from what we saw with P. falciparum. Um, and that's basically just based on the life cycle of the parasite, like we talked about with P. falciparum. Um, patients with P. vivax and ovale can actually survive for years. Um, and that, you know, is basically like, did the parasites go into this hypnozoite form? Or they can succumb really, really quickly. So there kind of isn't a lot of rhyme or reason. Because in some cases, patients progress very quickly to life-threatening conditions. And the symptoms of that would be things like delirium, because um, that obviously shows, you know, uh, neuro involvement, um, seizure, renal failure, um, shock, hepatic dysfunction. So all of these, you know, symptoms obviously indicate a very ill patient um, that is, you know, in a, a much more precarious uh position. Um, anemia is pretty common with this one. Anemia, I actually, I hesitate to list it here 
because it's also pretty common with some of the other malarials, right? Anytime we're lysing red blood cells so rapidly, um, anemia can certainly be a, a, con a consequence of that. Lung injury, pulmonary edema, and eventually acute respiratory distress, all associated with P. vivax novale. Um, and just like in P. falciparum, Remember, we're getting anemia because we're lysing the red blood cells very quickly. And anytime we lyse the red blood cells really quickly, then we have, you know, extra stickiness to the vasculature. We have binding to other red blood cells, which leads to that capillary plugging, um, which obviously is very dangerous and is pretty much the cause to all of these other symptoms. Um, to identify it, you're going to look for those Schufner dots with the trophozoite ring in the blood spear. Um, there is serology available, but the serology isn't really helpful, right? Because for this one, since patients can go dormant for years with their P. vivax or P. ovale, or they can get over it or whatever, if you have a patient that's really, really ill, they could be sick with something else and you're trusting the serology and it just turns out that they've got like a hypnozoite dormant form. So it, it's really just for epidemiologic survey, not for diagnosis. There's also a rapid diagnostic test, which um, can be used as like an adjunct to diagnosis. All right, last but not least, we're gonna talk about P. malariae. Um, interesting because this is the only one that actually says malaria in its name, but it's actually the least prevalent of the um, Plasmodia species that cause uh, malaria. Um, you find it pretty much in the same subtropical and temperate regions as all of the other malarial um, pathogens, just at like a slightly lower frequency. Um, this one actually has the longest incubation period, 18 to 40 days is the average, but some people, it could be months to, I mean, I've even heard years. So um, 18 to 40 is your average, but that doesn't mean you're out of the woods. Um, once again, starts with that flu-like feeling, and then we move into a Corten fever cycle. So what that means is you get a fever on day one, goes away a bit three days later, so 72 hours later, you get a fever again. So you get fever cycles on like day one and four. So like Monday, Thursday, and then so if we had our Tuesday, Wednesday, actually you would have Thursday off and then you'd have it on Friday and then Saturday, Sunday, Monday off and have it again on Tuesday. See what I'm saying? So it's kind of this, that's why it's called quartile. Um, fever attacks are moderate to severe, and they can last any uh, last about several hours and then occur every 72 hours. Um, and because this one is kind of so long-lasting, I mean, this one can last for 20 years, but it is less severe than the other um, malarias. Um, diagnosis is actually based on two very specific um, kind of cytopathic effects. So you can see this bar and band form here, um, and then there's also the rosette schizont, and that's pretty much that. That pretty much tells you you're dealing with P. malariae. There is um, there is an RDT, but it, it's not really recommended for this one. It's not very effective, um, and that's probably likely due to you know the lower prevalence of this particular organism in other malaria organism areas.